Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Sandy Longhorn. I'm an English instructor here at Pulaski Technical College, and I'd like to welcome you all to our first Big Rock Reading Series event for the 2014-2015 school year. Uh, it's so great to have a nice-sized audience show up tonight, and I think that you will not be disappointed in our presenter. Before we get started, if everyone would do the thing you need to do to put your cell phone on mute, silent, whatever it is, please do that. And I will ask, I know it's tempting to text your life away, but if you could uh, set that aside, you don't know it, but when you're out there texting, a little glare comes up on your face, and the person at the microphone can see that, and it can be very distracting. So, thank you for that. As we begin, I want to take a moment, as I always do if you've been to any of our events before, to thank our supporters from our PTC administrators, our support staff, the English department faculty, and from our donors who are listed on the back of your program. The series is only possible through the generous support of people and organizations like those listed there. And if you'll notice, there is a green donor form in your program. If you are moved by what you hear tonight and would like to help us bring more authors in, we do like to offer our authors a small honorarium for their time, and that's what this money goes for. So if, if your heart moves you to do so, there are some directions on that green sheet about how to go about that. And we now have a way for you to donate online that's in the program. There's also a pink survey in your program. At the end of tonight's event, if you would fill that out, we collect that data and we use it to apply for grants so that we can continue the program. That's very helpful for us. Make sure I cover all my bases here. Okay, so turning to tonight's program, we're going to hear from our speaker and then we're going to have the opportunity for a question and answer uh, session. So if anything comes up during Janice's reading that you would like to know more about, just jot yourself a note and you'll have a chance to ask her that after she's finished with her reading and discussion. After that, we will have books for sale. We take cash, check, or charge, and Janice will be happy to sign and talk with you at the end of the evening. For the official introduction, tonight we'll be hearing from Janice F. Kearney, a publisher, author, oral historian, and literacy advocate, Janice is one of 19 children born to parents who were Arkansas Delta sharecroppers and cotton farmers. She graduated from the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville with a BA in journalism and completed 30 graduate level hours in public administration and journalism. Janice has quite a list of accomplishments which are noted in your program and she's the author of six books. So she'll be talking mostly about her latest book tonight, but we do have samples of her other books up here afterwards if you'd like to check those out. Her most recent book is a memoir, Sundays with TJ, 100 Years of Memories on Varner Road, and it features the late TJ Carney, uh, the patriarch of her family. And so we'll turn it over to Janice, and uh, I'll be back with you when she's finished. Good evening. Good evening. It is wonderful to be here tonight. Wonderful to see you all here. I want to thank Sandy. I want to thank Pulaski Tech for having me here. Uh, I want to congratulate her on, what is it, four years, three years? Of this is the start of our fourth year. Four years, almost four years of ongoing, wonderful um, series of authors and poets. And I am very honored, very honored to be now part of this series. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about my latest book, Sundays with TJ, but I'm also going to tell you a little bit about my journey that brought me here tonight. Um, I'm going to read from Sundays with TJ before I, before I end tonight. Um, I was born in Gould, Arkansas. I'm a native of Arkansas. I grew up here. My family were Delta um, residents. They were sharecroppers. And how many of you know what a sharecropper is? A 
okay, I'm in Arkansas. <laughs> Believe me, I go many places and they've never heard of a sharecropper, so I don't have to explain to you what it is. Uh, but my, my father worked 50 acres of cotton um, all of the years that I grew up in, in Gould, Arkansas, and his children, my mother and father together, had 19 children. Uh, and we grew up in the midst of cotton. Picking cotton in the fall, chopping cotton in the summer, um, and the various other chores that are that you do when you are growing up on the farm. Um, I was the 14th of 19 children, and uh, though I was not the youngest, I was part of that young group. And my older siblings always joke that we never really got the brunt of growing up uh, in the cotton field the way they, that they did. I have siblings who could pick 400 pounds of cotton in a day, and I'm afraid I couldn't get much over 100. But those were hard times because we were very poor, but they were also good times. And when people ask me, especially if I'm not in Arkansas, they ask, how did you do it? How could you all do that? I mean, how could you pick cotton and chop cotton? And how could you live like that? And I tell them that it was our way of living that my parents taught us very early that this is a station in life. This is not your life. And they pushed us. They instilled in us very early the importance of things like what you're doing every day. Teaching yourself to be better, to become better, to reach for something more than what's in front of you. That's exactly what they told us. My parents were so very poor, we were very, so very poor, but I remember that my parents made it their business to become a part of our education. My father, who I, I talk about a lot, my father taught us all to read and write and count before we went to school. So before we knew anything about early education and kindergarten, uh, public kindergarten, we were taught the things that would kind of guarantee that we would succeed in school. And we did. Even the ones of us who had to stay out and chop cotton and pick cotton when other people were going to school, my father and mother said, when you go back to school, we need for you to do the very best you can. So their expectations of us meant so very much in my life in my journey and I still I still th give them the credit for all that I am the writing that I do a lot of it is thanks to what they gave me when I was growing up down in Gould Arkansas I did go to school in Fayetteville I chose journalism because journalism was the only option for me I was a creative writer at heart that's always what I've wanted to do um, but because they didn't have a creative writing program, I chose journalism. And I'm glad it did because it taught me some very basic things about good writing. So thank you to uh, the journalism department at the University of Arkansas for giving me an avenue to write and to um, appreciate the writing world that I didn't know about until I went to the University of Arkansas. After college, um, I was already married when I left college. I married my second year in college and I had my son. Uh, not in that order. Uh, but after college, I came back to Little Rock, Arkansas and worked for state gov government for a while. But then in 1987, something happened that I believe was ordained for me to happen for me. A woman that I had met when I was 16 years old by the name of Daisy Bates. Any of you heard of Daisy Bates? <laughs> this amazing woman. Let me just take a minute to tell you about my meeting her when I was 16 years old. My father, I think, was a little bit in love with her. She was a beautiful woman. And he used to tell us about how 
courageous she was, how wonderful um, she was, the things that she did with the 1957 Central High Crisis. Um, so she had moved to Mitchellville, which was about 10 miles from Gould, Arkansas, working on uh, one of the Johnson projects. And this summer, my junior year in, in high school, she needed a worker in her, in her uh, office. And my dad learned about it and he said, I'm gonna take you down and let you work for Daisy Bates. Well, I was very nervous because he had told me how great she was, but he took me down and I met Daisy Bates and I was nervous the whole time. She gave me a typing test and she said, I'm, I need someone who can type and someone who can file. And I said, I can do it. I can do both of those. Well, I took the typing test and I flunked it. <laughs> Daisy just sort of laughed and she said, well, go back and take typing again and come back and see me next summer. Well, I didn't take typing again and I didn't see Daisy for many, many years. But in 1987, by 1987, she had reopened her newspaper. If you know the history of the civil rights struggle here in Little Rock, Daisy and Elsie Bates owned a newspaper, one of the, the most prominent newspapers in the South. Because of their position with the 57 Central High Crisis, they were forced to close that newspaper. But one of the things that she had always promised her husband was that she would reopen the newspaper. So after he had died, actually, in 1984, she reopened it. In 1987, she needed a managing editor. And I knew that God was speaking to me. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I went to Daisy and I said, remember when I was 16? And I tried to go to work for you. I think I can pass that test now. So she hired me as her managing editor. I went to work for her. And by the way, anybody ever worked for a small newspaper, a small weekly newspaper? Let me tell you, it's harder than chopping cotton. It's really hard. But I had the ink in my veins by then and I believed what I was doing was so important, and I knew that it was important to Daisy Bates. So I worked very, very hard at the newspaper, and she walked in very shortly after I went to work for her and told me she was going to retire, she was going home, she was sick, she was tired, and I just cried because I had left my good state job to go to work for the newspaper. So I went home, cried, and you know, talked to my husband and prayed, and I came back the next day and asked her, would, would she sell it to me? Now, do you think I had enough money to buy a newspaper? So I just, I told her I could pay her so much down, and I could pay her over time, and she allowed me to do that. Because she said, she believed I had what is necessary to run a small newspaper, and that was the fire in the belly. Mm -hmm. She believed unless you had the fire in the belly, not only could you not run a newspaper, but there were very few things really worth anything in the world that you could do. If you read her book, Long Shadow Over Little Rock, you'll be able to see what she feels about the fire in the belly. But I, I took over the, the newspaper in 1988 and I ran it for a number of years. And um, I think that was one of the best decisions and the, one of the craziest decisions I ever made in my life. Uh, I'm so thankful to her for doing that. But in 1992, a governor who I knew very well decided he was going to run for president. So I was torn again. What am I supposed to be doing? because I believed in this governor. I believed he was presidential material. And I ended up taking a sabbatical from the newspaper and going to work for the campaign of William Jefferson Clinton. And when he was elected in 1993, I was getting ready. I was boxing all my stuff up, leaving the campaign to come back to my newspaper. And I was asked if I wanted to go to the White House. 
that was a very, people, nobody believes this. That was a hard decision for me. It was hard because by then, my father was a widower. He was in his late 80s. He and I had become very close. I was his caretaker. Anything I knew that I loved and cared about was in Arkansas. I'd never lived anywhere else in my life. So it really was a very hard decision. And I went to my dad and I asked him, what do you think I should do? And my dad, with tears in his eyes, said, you can't not go. I mean, what do you think your mother and I have been teaching you, instilling in you all these years? There's no way that you can't take an opportunity like this. And that made me feel better, but it still was hurt and painful to leave my dad. But you know what? I think my dad enjoyed my time at the White House more than I did. <laughs> One of the most memorable things is that my dad's 95th birthday was celebrated at the White House. The president invited him to the White House to, to uh, celebrate his 95th birthday. So that was an amazing, amazing time for him. Can you imagine what a 95-year-old man had seen in his lifetime, his expectations? Uh, so it was worth it. When I left the White House in 2001, and I did, I served as the president's personal diarist and you guys can ask me questions because I always get questions about that time and uh, what a personal diarist does and I'd be happy to talk to you about that. But it was an amazing opportunity for, for this girl from Barner Road in Gould, Arkansas who chopped cotton and picked cotton all of her childhood. It was an amazing opportunity. But in 2001, we left the White House and I began doing what I tell people I was put on this world, on this earth to do. I began writing. I began doing what I knew I was gonna do when I was probably six or seven years old. I fell in love with writing. I fell in love with stories, sitting at my dad's knee. T.J. Kearney was the best storyteller I've ever, ever met. I told Bill Clinton once, you're a great storyteller. I love listening to your stories, but you're number two. My dad is number one. So I knew I would be a writer. I just didn't know when. This book, Sundays with TJ, I started on a long time ago in my mind and in my heart. My father used to sit and tell us stories about his life, and he had an amazing life leaving home at 11 years old after his dad passed, traveling all over the country and into other countries, meeting all kinds of people, being a vagabond, basically, jumping trains. When I hear trains now all the time, I think of my dad. He would tell us how he jumped trains, and he and his brother for a long time would, would um, make that his, their traveling. That's how they traveled. So he lived an amazing life up until he was in his early 20s and he ended up coming back home. And one of the stories that my father told us that I always share, and every one of the Kearney grandkids and great grandkids know this story of how my dad got sick when he was in his 20s and he had this dream. And it was a dream about this beautiful girl that he had never seen before. And she told him who she was, and she said, I'm your wife. And he said, I've never seen you before. He's, but she kept telling him, I'm your wife. So my dad was sick for a couple of days, and it was back in the 30s. Um, so after he got better, it was around New Year's, and his cousin came down and asked him if he would go and help him kill hogs. You guys know about hog killing? Mm -hmm. Hog killing season? Well, my dad went with him down to his house. He was, his name was Nap, and he went down to his house and to help with the hog killing. 
but my dad wasn't really feeling good. So Nap said, why don't you go inside, lay down or just rest. My dad goes inside and he sees this girl and it is the exact same girl he'd seen in his dream. And then he says, well, I've got to be sure. He looks down at her feet, the exact same shoes that she had on. And he says, but I've got to be completely sure. And he goes in the bedroom. Back in those days, you know, people would come and visit and they'd throw the coats on the bed. My dad went in there and there was the green coat this girl had on in his dream. They dated for three months and then they married. And they were married for 45 years until my mother passed in 1982. And he and my mother, my mother believed it. Obviously, she fell in love with them immediately. Um, but we have shared that story with our children and our grandchildren. The, the title of the book, Sundays with TJ, when I talk about sharing, Sundays with TJ, the title goes back to our Sundays as a family. Back in the 70s. My family, when my mom found out that she, was, she had cancer, my mother wanted us to begin to have reunions. They didn't call them reunions exactly then, but she wanted us to grow closer together as a family. She understood mortality. From that point on, my family began having dinners together every Sunday. After my mom died, my father took over that role. So the children would come, would bring dinner, potluck. When our children grew up, they started doing the same, bringing dinner. Those Sundays became a part of who we were. We grew closer together. We bonded as a family. And it started with my mother, but it ended with my father. He would tell his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren. My father had, when he died in December of this past year, he had over a hundred grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And they can all tell just about every story he ever told over the years. We made sure of that. Family was extremely, extremely important. Up until he passed in December, my dad my dad fell um, in October of 2013, and he died in December. But up until October, he would share stories with me. And I would put those stories down, and I'd say, Dad, is that a story you want in the book? He said, yeah, I want that story. And he would come up with new stories. So as happy as I am about this book, the saddest part is that my dad didn't get a chance to read his story that he helped me create. But it means so much to me that I can share his stories with others. And I'm happy, happy to share it with you. And I'm gonna read a little bit, and I'm gonna put some glasses on that are probably gonna fall apart. <coughs> but I'm gonna see. See? <laughs> yeah, they really, they have been falling apart. So I'm going to try to try it. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit about his ch just before he left home. 1918 to 1936. The year 1918 would have been a hard time for any 11-year-old living in Southeast Arkansas a black child who was heir to an indigent existence all of his life and dependent on the luck of the draw gained double the strikes against him. Those strikes in 1918 in southeast Arkansas included the still lurking shadow of slavery, the curse of racism and racial prejudice, and the relegation of second-class citizenship that was still alive and well. For T.J. Kearney and his siblings, there had been a ray of hope, even with their poverty and scant education, 
even with a wife as indigent, constantly on the move to escape an unacceptable existence and in search of a better one. TC offered his children, especially his son, son TJ, hope. But like so many poor black sharecroppers, TC Kearney died quickly, unattended by a doctor, unceremoniously. With his death, death was the extinguishment of that ray of hope for the Kearney children. Most unfortunately, T.C. Kearney's death extinguished the one ray of light in his wife Cynthia's cloudy existence. 1918, the year of T.C. Kearney's unceremonious death, was also the year that peace temporarily settled upon the world and the year that his and Cynthia's son, Johnny, returned home after valiantly serving in, the, in France and the U.S during World War I. As far as TJ was concerned, the flu had been the more immediate and deadly enemy. Without being told, TJ realized he was on the cusp of the most transformative era of his life. Nothing in his life would ever be the same. Home would no longer be home. Family was less than it had been, now that Papa was no longer there. A child yet, T.J. could not, would not remain home, pretending that things were the same. Home reminded him of his father's suffering, a man with so much grit and integrity, perished at the hands of such an ugly death, all desperately trying to clear his airways of blood-tinged froth. T.J. would learn the details of his father's and his sister's death, Later, neither the white doctor's medicine nor his mother's herbs and teas saved T.C. Kearney. His young son would, son would never forget the sense of hopelessness in losing the best mean man he would ever know. The plague and its effect on families such as the Kearneys was the work of an intricate death machine, while world leaders conjunctured about what caused such a curse to take place, the Kearney family was one of the hundreds of thousands trying to make sense of the bottomless well of their pet personal loss and pain. There was a great deal of fear mixed in with their grief. What did the death mean for their futures, their livelihood? Young TJ and his siblings were suffering a double dose of loss with the death of their father and their beloved sister. It was a bad time for everyone. People everywhere was dying, and there was nothing doctors could do about it, T.J. recalled. He remembered a playground rhyme the children repeated when death became so common that it was acceptable. I had a little bird, its name was Enza. I opened the weather and I opened the window in influenza. The memory of his father's passing always reopened unhealed wounds and dulled the life in his eyes. Papa's passing, he said, was about the hardest thing I had ever had to go through. Though other memories of his blissful childhood would carry him through many a dark day, the loss of his father haunted him throughout his life. When Thomas Clayton took leave of the world, he took a huge part of his son's childhood with him, leaving a deep hole that no one would ever feel. And that was um, just before my father took off and left and began to travel the world and would go into Chicago and Kansas City and all over the West and put his age up and work in steel mills and, and on the railroad tracks and for restaurants, and my father was a great cook, and he said he learned that those many years he was traveling around the world, around the country, uh, working. And he also became a merchant. Um, I guess you call him a merchant? Uh, Marine. Marine. He traveled to Cuba and the UK and the Fiji Islands, 
working on the ships when he was very, very young. So he, he would tell us all these stories. Again, I fell in love with stories, and I fell in love with writing, sitting at my dad's knee, listening to his amazing life stories. So let me end with this from me. This is the end of the book called The Things I Carried With Me. I am Janice Faye Kearney, and I will always remember the perfect dawns of June, July, and August, broken by the muted crunch of gravel and rocks as we brave the chill of those summer mornings, our silent trek into daddy's cotton field into the damp, cold dew, blanketing every living or dead thing, soaking our bodies, our clothing, chilling us to the bone for just a short time before the scorching sun burned us dry. I remember the strange and perfect choreography of my family's age-old dance, TJ and his children holding the chopping hose straight and tight as we stretched ourselves toward the delicate cotton plant, our universal focus, ridding daddy's 40 acres of any hint of wayward grass. When what seemed like forever came to an end, so began our barefoot walk home on the hot, sharp, but somehow soothing gravel and rocks. Tired, sated, hoarding our secret dreams, happy for the freedom to dream. Later, when the summer days shorten, a different dance begins amidst the golden aura of the autumn and later the harsh cold of Arkansas winters. On those fall mornings, we climb quietly onto Daddy's pickup truck, hugging our poker sacks to us. I remember the exquisitely painted green speckled bowls and the soft, tantalizingly white stuff, inviting our touch and us bracing before the bending, dragging, and filling sacks until they are erect with the weight of the beautiful whiteness we feed it. I remember how we held our breaths and nervous stomachs beside the cotton wagon, staring and sending up silent prayers to the brown rusted scales and the almost thoughts of hate for the cotton, the pulling, the tugging of it that ended at daddy's unforgiving cotton scales. Mine was a childhood surrounded by cotton and filled with the awe of the world around me. My world back then was made up of mama, daddy, and other Kearney children. I remember the vast, endless cotton fields, the truck patches bursting with colors and smells that ensured we wouldn't starve during the cold, heartless winters. Long, wide rows of butter beans decorated by the butterflies atop their blooms, the beautiful and ugly yellow squash and perfectly red tomatoes. I was in awe of the endless woods that drew me during my saddest times and the forgiving bow that gave such joy to my brothers in their few hours of leisure on summer's eves. My awe extended to the human inhabitants of my world, our neighbors and the children we knew, a few we called friends of the fathers, solid men who rarely said more than one or two words to us children, and the mothers who said little more but offered up the kindest and most loving smiles and tea cakes and Kool-Aid. And the family's dogs that were never truly family, but most often sat with us during our visits and escorted us home at the end of those visits. Before we moved to the home that Daddy built on Barner Road, we lived on the Wilk Farm, some five miles away, yet on the bayou, but a fairy tale. Five acres my family made into home for almost a decade. I remember turning five and then six, and the red and blue gingham dresses Daddy bought, brand new for mine and Joanne's first day of school. I remember the large and aged fruit trees were more than simple bearers of fruit, but perfect shades during these southern summers. As we lay resting from our morning work, a slight breeze would bend the fruit trees, sending apples, peaches, or pears, spilling onto the ground beside our heads or onto our stomachs. How deep is that memory? Now, the slightest caress of wind on my face in spring or summer brings memories 
and the pungent aroma of daddy's fruit orchard. Varna Road, an imprint, a mental tattoo in my memory cells, the grossly imperfect gravel road that flooded each time it rained, it merited only an annual grading, yet insinuates itself into my most treasured memories of my childhood life. Like daddy, I was a dreamer, dreaming of tomorrow when I wouldn't walk half asleep and barefoot down the cotton roads at six in the morning, when mama would, would, would wake me an hour before time for the school bus, before heating my bath water on the wooden stove to half whisper that today I would stay out to help daddy make his bail. It is because I am one of 19 children that I have never understood the emotion of loneliness. Older and younger siblings, as many as 10, taking up room in the house, loud and competitive and heartless, detecting your weakness and bearing down until you cry, uncle. Oh, how I hate it. Pardon me. Oh, how I hated each of them in turn, and loved each of them, and all of them, ferociously and unconditional, <coughs> unconditionally, because they were a part of the imperfection and awesomeness that was my childhood, that was anchored by T.J. and Ethel out on Varner Road. Thank you, T.J. Kearney, for a lifetime of memories and for transforming your family's reality into miracles. Thank you. We have time for questions. Anybody has a question? Thanks, Bob. I'm just going to walk the end, right? <laughs> <laughs> questions? Yes? Um, his question was, what was a personal diarist? A personal diarist, I was the first personal diarist to a president in history. Um, as a personal diarist, my role was to chronicle the president's day. I actually kept a diary of his day. I was um, asked to sit in on meetings. I would travel with him. I went to events that he, um, he went to during the day or sometimes at night. I kept a day file of all of the uh, paperwork and all of the different things, that documents, letters, logs that came through the Oval Office. I was a part of his Oval Office staff and I would keep that as well. So when he left in 2001, he not only had my rings and rings of personal diary, but he had big boxes of files, of day files, that would show him what things came through his office each and every day. Uh, who came to visit? Who called him on the phone? What was going on in the world uh, on this particular day? Because I kept newspapers. If he traveled, I would keep um, uh, pool reports uh, that told everything that he did when he traveled if I wasn't traveling with him. So my role was his living biographer during his time as president. And is some of that material available at the library? Some of it is. My diary, per se, is not there yet, but the promise is that it will be there eventually. But the day files, they do use those in the library. Yes. With all the memories you have of the home place, I'm wondering what happened to it now. Is it still the family still there? Yes, yes. My father, <clears throat> I didn't say this, but my father lived alone out on Varner Road until he was 103 years old. At 103, something happened that made him know and certainly made us know that we needed to move him into town. So his, his, those two acres actually is what he owned. And that's where he built his house there um, on those two acres. 
that still belongs to the Kearney family. We rented it out, it's rented out to someone. But in uh, 2010, I think it was, he moved into Gould, and there's a house there also that we've rented out. Yes? <laughs> it was fun most of the time. We did fight. We were very competitive. Um, we barked a lot. So, you know, and my parents were very strict. So, a lot of times when we fought, we would stop just before my parents would see us because my parents would make us kiss each other if they caught us fighting. So we all hated that. So uh, we would fight until they came around and then we wouldn't fight anymore. But it was, I loved it. I loved growing up with my family. But the one thing, as I think I alluded to, I am a loner. And I'm sure that has something to do with me growing up with so many people, but I like my space. My husband can tell you that. I love my space and I love being alone. I can, you know, I, I'm very seldom can I ever say that I'm lonely. Yeah. You don't get to answer the question. Seeing that your family has such a lineage and heritage, do you see that that it has still influences the generation as far as the grandkids? Oh yes, definitely, definitely. Um, I'm very proud of most of my my. Um, Grand, not my grandkids, but my nephews and nieces. I have a son, and he has twins. So we we try to carry on, um, push forward the things that we learned growing up uh, from my parents. It worked with them, so I think it could work with other people, especially the high expectations uh, of of your child and also teaching them to love themselves and hard work, the ethic of hard work and education, the power of education and reading, all those things, we, I think we all have tried to pass those on. Yes? How many brothers and sisters between the boys and girls? Uh, there were 11, bo uh, 11 boys, 8 girls. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Uh-huh. Okay, uh, do you know how many tea cakes? Because I know those. Your mother does? I need well, to... I know that you know, but I heard you say... No, you know what? I don't know how to make tea cakes, but I would love to know how to pick, make tea cakes because I love tea cakes. I really did. Thank you. My mother made biscuits, too, from scratch, and my father as well, and I don't know how to make those either. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Well, let's talk later, okay? Yes. So how often do you go home to visit? Now, well, I used to, my father, when my father lived in Gula, I would go every week. I mean, a couple of times a week. Uh, then he moved in with my husband and I a couple of years ago. Um, and we would take him back because he was also superintendent of his church up until the time he passed. So he loved his church. So we, take, we would take him back to his church. We would go back every week. Now I go, as I, I stopped going for a while because it was too painful to think of him when I went there, but now I'm starting to go back more. Yes? So, so you obviously loved that. I was wondering if whenever you were constructing this book, did you change or appreciation of his life before and after coming? Did I? I'm sorry, I did not. Yeah, um, while you were making the book, did you like, did anything awaken to you and you're just like, oh, this is what I'm doing now? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I think that happens every t any time that I'm, I'm writing a book. One of the things that people will ask is how in the world do you remember some of the things that you write? It's the process of writing. I think it generates things that probably are just stuck back there somewhere in your brain and you never think of. Uh, so a lot of things came forward that I hadn't thought of in a long time. Uh, as far as what I thought was important to write about, I don't think I changed very much as far as that's concerned. 
Yes. Um, following up with his question, how, uh, how does your actual life and experience affect your writing in your like the setting theme style? Is it like uh, childhood nostalgia, nostalgia or looking through adult eyes and situations and watching them both? That's a great question, and I can't repeat that question, but <laughs> how did my childhood impact the way I write? Um, and whether I write uh, based on my childhood or looking at my childhood through a dead eyes, I, I think I do both of those. Um, definitely, when you're in that zone of writing, you're back there. I mean, I think you write best if you're kind of back there, you're writing as if you're right there. Uh, of course, once you go back and look at everything, then you're looking at it from now. Um, did you get everything right? Did your memory serve you right? Was there something that you left out? But I write best when I get into that zone as if I'm really there. Yes, ma'am? That's a good question. I, there are lots of writers that I, I really, really love. And you know, the late Maya Angelou, I really liked her a lot. Um, one of my favorite books was her, her book, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. But I, I liked a lot of writers. Betty Smith, uh, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, was one of my first books that I read. And I absolutely loved that. I loved a lot of um, mysteries when I was growing up. I really, truly liked a lot of mysteries. So I'm not, you know, there's not one person, one author that I would say uh, impacted me more than any others, but there are lots of different writers that I, I read a lot. My husband, husband can tell you that too. Uh, so I'm, I think I'm influenced by a lot of different writers. Right. 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 I, I, I don't think my writing really changed, but I do think their leaving made me think of a lot of things that I don't think of when they're here. Uh, my mother's leaving made me remember some really, really poignant times that I had with her because you begin to miss those times. Like early morning, I talk about in my first book, Cotton Pill of Dreams, how my early mornings with my mom meant so much. And I, I kind of learned who she was during that time because she was in her own space. Her kitchen was, her, was hers. Out of everything in the house, that was hers. And I would come in before I got ready to go to school and spend that time with her and just watched her. And she was so confident, uh, you know, in that space. And it was the only time I, I wrote this, that it was the only time that I remember hearing her sing. My mother had a beautiful voice, but you never heard her sing. But it was during that time, when she was in her space in that kitchen, that I, would, I remember her singing and, you know, just letting me hear that beautiful voice of hers. So it's not that I changed my writing style so much, it's just that when they're gone, all of those things that you just kind of didn't think about, they come to you. you. You remember all those things. Okay, we have one more question. Okay, I'm going to let Bob Nash, my husband, ask okay. his question first. <laughs> and then, did, what was your question, Bob? No. <laughs> no, I, was, I was just going to make a comment. Somebody said, what would you like growing up with all those kids? I, I eat fast, right? I, I didn't. I know when we first got married, she ate twice as fast as I did. She said, why do you eat so fast? She said, if I didn't eat fast at all, she went, I wouldn't get anything to eat. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I didn't let you ask the question. <laughs> Can we, can we get this yes, yes, please. Go. Okay. Uh, you said that you were interested in creative writing in college, but because they offered you took journalism instead, how did that affect your early writing? Did it 
change it to like a career type right type writing because I know for newspapers versus like regular mm -hmm. versus kind of different. It is different, and and again, I really learned a lot. That is a more restrictive writing, um, and I think that helped me a lot. Um, I was a and I was able to use it because when I worked for state government, I was in information. I was director of information for, in a num number of roles, so I was able to do that. And of course, when I took over Daisy Bates newspaper, I was able to use it. So it it came in very handy. But also, just writing in that style helped me because you have to be concise and 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 you have to say what you're saying in a much fewer words. So I really, I learned a lot. And I think I write a little bit like that because of that, that training. Uh -huh. Thank you, Janice. That was really wonderful. Um, before we go, could you all get your pink survey out and fill that out? And uh, Joan Dudley is going to come up and stand at this door up here. And when you file out, if you would hand those to her. And while you're doing that, check in your program. Do you have a golden ticket? Yeah. All right, somebody hold one up so we can see it. If you have a golden ticket, it will say, congratulations, you've won a book. Uh, so we have a library of some new and some gently used books over here. And with that ticket, you can come up, and if Joey will come up and help guide that process, you can exchange your ticket for a free book to take home tonight. And of course, we have Janice's books for sale, um, and I'm sure she'd be glad to sign them. And if you'd just like to come up and shake her hand uh, and say hello, that's perfectly acceptable, too. In the program, we announce our next reading, which is October 14th, and I hope we'll see some of you there. Let's thank Janice one last time. Thank you.